Okay, so hello everyone. So this is Sandeep uh, from GIS Institute of Advanced Studies and Research, Kolkata. Uh, on behalf of uh, Center for Health Science and Technology, GIS IAA, sir, I welcome to the first webinar uh, of the webinar series five. Thank you all for being here. Before I take the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, I would like to mention that we uh, offer MSc in Medical Biotechnology and Bioinformatics, Advanced Diploma in Bioinformatics and PhD programs. And it is my pleasure to mention that we are going to organize an international symposium in the last week of February. So I think you can see the details uh, on the screen and more details you can get at our website at www.gisiasr.org. So uh, it is indeed a pleasure here today to introduce the guest speaker, Dr. Uh, Deepayan Rudro. Dr. Rudro studied biochemistry at the Department of Biochemistry, University of Calcutta. He received PhD from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, New York. He did his postdoctoral research at laboratory of Dr. Alexander Rudinsky at University of Washington, Seattle, and the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, New York. Uh, then he joined at the Pohang University of Science and Technology and the Institute for Basic Sciences, South Korea, as a principal investigator and associate professor as well. He also played the senior scientist role at Immunobiome Company. At present, he is the associate professor at School of Life Science and Technology, Shanghai Tech University, China. He was recipient of uh, several prestigious uh, fellowships and awards like Welcome Trust, DBT India Alliance Fellowship, Ramalinga Summit Fellowship, and so on. And uh, his uh, main research areas include uh, immune tolerance, autoimmunity and inflammation, regulatory T cells, tumor immunology. He has immense contribution in this field and is a prestigious author of a number of high impact journals papers. On a final note, he is also a fascinating individual and we are grateful for his presence among us today. So today uh, we'll be uh, here to listen and learn on immunological tolerance and uh, regulatory T cells. Uh, live streaming of this talk is available on our YouTube channel, Chest GISIASR. Please write your questions regarding the talk to the chat section of the Zoom or comment section of YouTube, uh, which will be addressed at the end of the talk. Without uh, further delay, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Deepayan Rudra. Thank you. Share my screen now. Right? Uh, yes, I have answered already now. Thanks a lot, uh, Shundip, for uh, such a generous introduction. So, uh, before starting, I'll I'll want to you know introduce uh, my the university I recently moved into. It's in Shanghai, China. It's called Shanghai Tech University. So this is this inset. This is the map of of Shanghai, and actually, so this river is called Huangpu River, which cuts down Shanghai uh, throughout through its middle. Towards the east side, this is called Pudong. And on the west side is called Pushi. And we are located over here. And it's a, it's a kind of new university which started in 2012, has five different schools and two different uh, institutes. And I am affiliated with the School of Life Science and Technology right here. Uh, as you can see, it's it's kind of a sizable campus, although not uh, because it's a science and technology institute uh, university. It's not a very big one, and so this here, right here, is my my lab, and this is the place where I live in. And as you can imagine, we have just started building up the lab from scratch, and I was for, I'm fortunate to have three students who, after 
their rotations have agreed to join the lab. So we are starting off now. And I am, uh, the way I am trying to put on this presentation is kind of in two parts. One, the first part will be a little bit of teaching uh, uh, because I, I think that many of, many of the, you know, the spectators are uh, students uh, you know, or in their undergrad studies or graduation, or some of them are PhD aspirants. So I will, uh, you know, introduce uh, immunological tolerance and uh, what we know about regulatory T cells in a teaching mode. And the second part will be, uh, I'll discuss some of uh, one, one particular story that we published last year. And please free, feel free to interrupt me and ask me any questions throughout the talk. And, uh, and you can email me if you have any questions in the future. So uh, as you can see, the, basically the, you know, my, the, the, the title of my talk is Immunological Tolerance and Regulatory T-cells. So it has two parts. One is Immunological Tolerance, another one is Regulatory T-cells. So, First, I will describe what is immunological tolerance. And the second part will be what are regulatory T cells and why is it important to study about regulatory T cells. And I will start with this saying, and may, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, of, this, of this phrase that the power of immune system is a double-edged sword. And it was coined by Dr. William Paul, who was in the National Institutes of Health. He was a very uh, prolific immunologist and uh, Unfortunately, he passed away in 2015. And this is indeed a very meaningful uh, uh, phase because, it, uh, and that is the first thing which I learned when I started learning immunology is that it can affect our lives in both good ways as well as in bad ways. So in a good way, immunology, it ensures healthy living and in different ways. Of course, it was the primary uh, reason why I think and most of us think that the immune system evolved is to fight infectious diseases. And with time, it has become more apparent that uh, in our body, it, it is a, a one of the first and foremost uh, uh, cell types which, which affects, which actually controls uh, neoplastic growths in our body and combats cancer. And in more recent years, it has been, it has becoming, it is becoming more apparent that it has kind of non-immune functions. For example, now we know that the immune system is required for efficient tissue development, repair, regeneration, as well as healing. So, so basically immune system integrates into a larger paradigm uh, of human health for the benefit of organs, human health and human resources. So these are the good parts of the, of the immune system. On the other hand, as you can understand, immunity can be self-destructive. So if we cannot, if you don't control this, uh, uh, the over exuberant uh, immune response that is required for, you know, uh, the, to mount uh, effective immune response, it can lead to different kinds of autoimmune diseases as well as hypersensitivity diseases. And, and in, in other clinical aspects, it can, it can be detrimental for, for example, organ transplantation, things like that. So, you know, we are, we are uh, in our daily life, we are encountering different kinds of foreign objects, for example, you know, food antigens and, and other things as well as our, our uh, intestine is filled with microorganisms, which can be uh, commensal or is, which can be you know, harmful to our health. So there must be a, a balance that has to be uh, you know, kept in, uh, in, in, so that either you, you, uh, you cannot basically uh, uh, react against all the immune organisms, all the organisms that are present in your intestine, because many of these are harmless or in, in a way innocuous organisms. So you have to under the immune system has to distinguish between the organisms which are good or bad uh, for our daily life. So in that way, there must be 
a mechanism of tolerance by which it tolerates the innocuous organisms. <clears throat> So before I get into more details of, of the, uh, you know, uh, the immune, uh, how the immune system works, et cetera, I'll just, in one slide, I will discuss about, you know, the timeline of what happens when you are exposed to a uh, foreign organism. So at the, the first line of defense, as you know, is the innate immune system, and there are basically two phases of the innate immune system. One is the immediate phase and then the in induced uh, innate immune system that, uh, and almost 95% or 99% of, of the, of the you know, foreign attacks which we encounter are taken care of by this. However, in an event when the internal immune system loses, it calls upon to the adaptive immune system. And basically there are two main arms of that. One is the humoral mediated by the beast. Other one is the T cell mediated adaptive immune system. And because today's talk deals with regulatory T cells, I will mainly talk about the T cell uh, mediated adaptive immune system. And how it works is basically the dendritic cells, for example, they are, or the you know, antigen presenting cell, it takes up the antigens and it presents this antigen over the major histocompatibility uh, complex. And this MHC peptide complex is recognized by uh, so-called naive T cells, which where there are two types, one is the CD4 and the CD8 types. And eventually this triggers what we call immune activation or T cell activation. And eventually they, from one, one cell, these, these clones, each chronotypes, which recognize this MHC peptide, they can proliferate and become affected T cells. And this is a, a very uh, prolific process. And if this is not controlled properly, this can uh, cause uh, uh, collateral damage to your, your body and the tissue and tissue damage. And eventually it is, it can be really detrimental for human health. Why is this, uh, why are the T cells so, so uh, uh, vulnerable in this context? Because we know this, this T cell risk that are present on the, on the T cells, they are organized, they, they, are, they are made by random rearrangements of T cell receptor gene segments in a very def definite and very a complicated process. I will not get into details into that. And, but the bottom line is that it has the capability, capability, the T cell receptors have the capability of potentially recognizing any antigen under the arc. So it can also recognize self antigens which are present in your body. However, there are ways by which the adaptive immune system has evolved to overcome this problem of self, you know, the overacting self reactivity of this of TCRs and the T cells. And this thing, this phenomena is what is called immunological tolerance. So that uh, the immune system ensures that, you know, your body does not, does not recognize your own self antigen and act against it. And this is, this is what, what immunological tolerance uh, means. And there are several ways by that, by which this happens. And the first and foremost way is something which is called the central tolerance. And this starts to happen in the thymus where the T cells are uh, actually generated and develop, the, the T cell development happens. And what happens is the T cells which have self-reactive TCRs or T cell receptors, which can recognize self uh, antigens and turn against your own body. These are del deleted by the process by a process uh, which obviously I'm not going to go into details. And so basically the, the, the T cells which have self-reactive T cell receptors, which can very strongly bind to again presenting MHC complexes uh, in, in the thymus are, are eliminated. <clears throat> so almost more than 90% of the, of the T cell receptor containing T cells that recognizes your own antigens are, delete, are deleted in. And many of these, which actually can recognize, are diverted to become something else, which, which actually do not turn against you. So these are this combination of these two processes 
called central tolerance. However, many of these cells actually can still recognize self. Obviously, this is not a hundred percent, you know, and many of them actually come out, and they come out from the from the from the thymus to the periphery, which is the lymphatic system where these uh, immune the you know the white blood cells reside and they circulate. However, in the periphery, when they come out over there, then the self-reactive T cells can be inactivated by various ways. They can be diverted to something which is not uh, so much detrimental for your body. They can be actually ignored. For example, let's say there is there is an antigen which is present in an immune uh, in a in a place where the immune system or the T cells cannot reach properly. For example, inside the eye, let's say, uh, which is which where they cannot uh, enter, so they are ignored in that way. And the most important process of this immunological tolerance is something called suppression or immunological suppression. And for the rest of my talk, I will talk about this immunological suppression. So the most important mechanism is this immunological suppression. And this is a mechanism by which regulated by other T cells, which are a little bit different from these. And these, there are various kinds of these kinds of T cells or these kinds of immune cells, which regulates the self-reactive T cells. These are coming up. Uh, throughout the years in the in the recent past, and most important among them is what I'm going to talk about today. And this is these are the regulatory T cells. <clears throat> so regulatory T cells are basically a, a subtype of CD4 positive T cells. There are two types of, uh, broadly speaking, there are two types of T cells. One are the C, when one which express this uh, uh, molecule called CD4, another one which expresses the molecule called CD8. They have both of them are PCR alpha beta positive, and these regulatory T cells are subtype of uh, CD4 positive uh, T cells. <clears throat> and they were initially identified by the presence of this molecule called CD25, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, one of the subunits of this IL2 receptor. Uh, and it is called the IL2, it is also called IL2 receptor alpha, which is present on the surface. So that is how they were identified at the beginning. And later on, it was found that they express this transcription factor called FOXP3. It's, of course, my, my favorite transcription factor, which is required for the generation and function of this regulatory T cell. So as you can understand that, of course, self-reactive T cells uh, can cause different kinds of lesions and different kinds of autoimmune diseases, for example, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, IBD, arthritis, etc., and of course transplant rejection. And on the other hand, regulatory T cells are the T cells which has which actually poses a break on this, these uh, autoimmune diseases and suppresses them. So in that way, uh, these are beneficial properties of regulatory T cells. So of course, uh, you know these are T reg cells are good in that aspect. On the other hand, can you actually think of a darker side of these regulatory T cells? And of course, actually they have a darker side and that is in the context of tumors. So in our body, there are these tumor growth or what we call neoplastic growth that are continually happening inside our body. And on the other hand, for example, CD8 positive T cells, which produces uh, which have, which by producing cytokines like interferon gamma, they call upon immune cells, for example, macrophages and NK cells that continuously, you know, keeps this tumor growth in check by, by directly killing these tumor cells as well as by other mechanisms. But by virtue of the, you know, immune, uh, uh, tol Im 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 uh, by virtue of this, of, uh, of the function of these regulatory T cells by which they can suppress the function of these activated immune cells, they can suppress anti-tumor immunity, these T-reg cells. So basically these T-reg cells can be obstructive to anti-tumor immune responses. So this negative action on these uh, activated immune cells uh, keeps them from acting or poses a break on them, 
And because they are trying to kill the tumor cells, this actually helps the tumor cells to grow. So in, in that way, uh, T-Rex cells have dual functionalities. One is it can suppress inflammation and autoimmune diseases. On the other hand, it promotes cancer. So these two-pronged effects of regulatory T cells makes them uh, important uh, cell types uh, in our body. And uh, researchers all over the world are trying to you know, use these regulatory T cell uh, uh, So for example, if you can enhance the induction of T-Rex cells uh, in the context of inflammation or autoimmunity, that will be beneficial. On the other hand, if you can somehow suppress their function in the context of tumor, that can be uh, utilized, that has the potential to be used uh, in, therapeutic, uh, in a therapeutic manner in the context of cancer. So that was my first part. And I, dis I discussed, I, I, I mentioned how what, are, what is immunological tolerance and what are regulatory T cells and why is it important to study regulatory T cells. Second part, I will basically discuss about the discovery of FOXP3 as a lineage specificity factor. And the main reason is uh, basically two, two reasons. One is I think it's a, it's a very nice story. Uh, and I think you will like you know, the, you know, the process, how it was discovered. And also, it, uh, I think it poses a very important lesson to anybody who is, you know, any, because it is a perfect example uh, to understand how different unrelated observations throughout the course of history over uh, a several different, I mean, almost a century of research or more than 50, 60 years of research, discovery of Fox P3, and it has led to this very interesting. Uh, therapeutically relevant T-Rex cell research. So, uh, the I will start with this, you know, old observation that the researchers came upon uh, in the early 70s, and there was this uh, discovery that uh, not discovery; it was a serendipitous observation where uh, it was found that let's say if you if you if you do a thymectomy they were born. So for example, if you can take out the thymus from mice within three days uh, of their, after they were born, it's whole body, whole body autoimmune diseases in this mouse. So let me get back a little bit. So in the thymus, there are T cell development happening, CD4 and CD8 cells, they develop. And they, at that time, they are naive cells. They have not encountered a lot of antigens and they are not proliferated and they are not activated at this point. However, it is known that, so for example, embryonic day 11, thymic development starts of T cells. And by the time mice are born, which is about uh, 21 days uh, of the embryonic development, at that time, uh, you know, they have a full-fledged immune cell, like T cells developed in their, in their thymus, and which are then coming out to the periphery from the thymus. So it was well known you know, during this time when this experiment was done that the, the mice have full-fledged immune, immune cells the, or the lymphocytes develop, T cells develop in the thymus, and they have, they are coming out in the periphery, okay? So, but when it was a surprise that if the thymus is then, thymectomy is done three days after the mice are born, some of this, this uh, there is some, a lot of self-reactivity re reactivity is happening by, uh, by these, you know, uh, immune cells. Are, and that causes autoimmunity. And this was a surprise because if anything, if you take out the thymus, the T cells won't be there, if, if anything. And it was, uh, you know, uh, autoimmune diseases. And the hypothesis that was uh, generated at that time is that probably within this three days period of time, this is a critical window, at that time, uh, 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 esoteric, uh, uh, a specific kind of uh, T cell is being developed in the thymus, which 
uh, required to you know, have a break on some kind of self-reactive T cells that are causing all this autoimmunity. And because you are taking, you are, you are eliminating the thymus or because you are surgically taking out the thymus within these three days, somehow are not being meant, uh, being produced or generated in the thymus. And that somehow cannot, you know, uh, suppress this self-reactivity, which is causing the autoimmune disease in this model. And first kind of, uh, you know, um, hypothesize that these, these cells have this kind of a, a polis, you know, uh, they kind of have a, this kind of a property of like a polisman, which is, which should keep this self-reactivity in check. I will now, so this was in 1970s. Now I will fast forward to 1990s. And in 1995, there was a seminal discovery by this gentleman, Shimon Sakaguchi. And this is uh, Shimon in Postec in Korea uh, with my students. Uh, and this was in, I think back in 2015 that he, uh, you know, but and what he was doing, he was in, uh, in National Institutes of Health at that time, I think. And he was trying to identify these such kind of T cells, which these esoteric T cells are, which are required for the immune suppression. And he was trying different kinds of cell surface antibodies to determine if he can determine uh, or find out a population of T cells, which can you know, fulfill this criteria. And, and after a, you know, a long, like many years of research, he actually found out that CD25 is a marker that can mark these cells, that can be, you know, these cells, these particular cells are present, are, are basically these express CD25 on the cell surface. This is a fax plot where, the, so basically these are CD4 positive, CD25 positive cells, which are present approximately three to four percent are present in the thymus. And when they come out and into 15% of these cells. So these cells was found. So as I said, uh, they compri uh, comprise about 10 to 15% of the CD4 positive T cells in mice and also in humans. And they require IL-2 or this interleukin-2 kind, which is required for survival and expansion of these cells. And surprisingly, he found that if you can use an antagonistic antibody, which can actually bind to CD25 and inactivate these cells, that results in whole multi-organ autoimmune diseases in these mice. This was the connection that he kind of, you know, uh, kind of uh, came up that maybe these are the these these are the cells which are those the cells that were lacking in those uh, day three uh, thymectomized mice, and probably these would you know be. Uh, uh, missing piece of the puzzle. So this discovery, so this was a cell surface marker CD25. However, it was not at that time, it was of course not understood how these cells were made and we are this actually this uh, specific lineage uh, of T cells that, that are required for immune suppression. And this discovery led to the search of a lineage determining transcription factor that is required for the functions and the generation and functions of these cells. And I gave you that this is FOXP3 and I will now talk about how FOXP3 was identified in this context. So now I will again go back and now I will, I'll go back to 19, uh, you know, 30s during the second world war. And during this time, uh, remember Manhattan Project when the nuclear bomb was being, you know, they were trying to, you know, uh, Americans trying to develop the uh, nuclear bomb. At that time, by anticipating that this, uh, the ionization uh, radiation that a nuclear bomb will, is going to, you know, generate, they were trying to identify, they're trying to understand what effect that will have on human, human life. So basically, they built up this uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee and Dr. William Russell and his wife, uh, Leanne Russell, they were uh, in charge of this huge uh, facility. And <clears throat> what, 
uh, this uh, facility was doing was that they were taking cages after cages of this, you know, of mice, and they were treating them with ionization radiation, uh, just to understand what effect if if the this this has any effect on. So, for example, the mutations that will this will cause if that can affect the, uh, you know into a phenotype in these mice. And after a lot of experiments, this is what they came up. There was this mice that, uh, this, this strain that was generated, which is actually called a scarfy mouse. And I'll, in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about this. So basically these mice, these poor mice, they were, they, they have complete whole body autoimmunity. And they look like, like this is a three week or four week old mouse compared to the, the wild type. They have huge spleen and huge lymph. This is because of you know, immune cell infiltration in their spleen, uh, which causes splenomegaly or lymphadenopathy by immune cell inf infiltration in, inside their uh, lymph nodes. And they have <clears throat> this so-called scarfy phenotype where you know, the, the, basically the immune cells that infiltrate in the skin and causes you know, skin damage to a, 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 a visibly uh, tails. And not only this, if you open this mice, uh, the immune cells. So this basically causes whole body autoimmune diseases in these mice. And very interestingly, there was a disease and there is also, I mean, still there is this disease where uh, and it happens only in boys. And this is called the IPEC syndrome. It's called, it's, uh, the full name is Immune Dysregulation Polyendocrinopathy and Enteropathy X-linked. And this happens only in boys because it's an X-linked disease. And these, they uh, present autoimmune lesions all over and all kinds of autoimmune diseases that you can, uh, you know, imagine they get those. And this is also, they also have, uh, you know, cytokine storms and lymphadenopathy and, uh, and, and everything. <clears throat> and these poor fellows, they, they die uh, very early in their life. So, because there is this, this commonalities between the scarfy mice and these, uh, uh, these IPEX patients, Researchers tried, were trying to identify what are the mutations, hoping that maybe it's the same mutation that is happening in the, in the mouse and man. Then you can probably correlate that with the, you know, those uh, day three thymectomized mice, mice as well as the CD25 positive. And to make a long story short, they eventually found that indeed these mutations were, were present on a specific protein uh, transcription factor, which is FOXP3. And these, these arrows are the, are the sites where the mutations are. And this is the, you know, it is the forkhead protein is de decorated by various kinds of protein domains. For example, ink finger, leucine zipper, forkhead domain, which is a DNA binding as an N terminal repressive domain. And eventually it was also, so this was in human that was found. It was also discovered that the specific mutation which was happening in the RFI mice was this insertion of two codons, two, uh, sorry, two uh, residues in, the, in this, in this uh, spot. It resulted in premature stop codon so that the forkhead uh, domain Actually, by nonsense mediated decay, this uh, the the FOXP3 was getting eliminated from these mice, so they don't have this protein. So these findings suggested there might be a connection between this FOXP3 and C25. So the hypothesis is that FOXP3 is indeed maybe it is a, a key linear specific factor to generate these uh, regulatory T cells, and how will you test that, right? So here at this point, and uh, you know, so this is my post documenter, Dr. Alexander Rudensky, and actually Shondip, me, 
uh, Shujai, who is now in JIS, and also uh, Kamaki. Uh, I came to know that she was also in, in, in Seattle. So I started my postdoc in Seattle, University of Washington. And then the lab moved to uh, Memorial Sloan Cat. Uh, so I was in uh, Dr. Rudensky's lab during this time. And this is a, a photograph when he visited again uh, in Boston. So Dr. Rudensky's lab, as well as several other, two, two other labs to be precise. One, one was Shimon Sakaguchi's lab and Fred Ramstel's lab. They were trying to identify, to, you know, to find out if indeed FOXP3 is the factor which is required for T-Rex cell generation and function. And the first thing that they did was to make a null. And indeed, they found uh, uh, of these FOXP3 null mice to what I showed for the scarfy mice. And this is how the mouse looks. They have exactly the same phenotype. They have scaly tails and uh, you know lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, and all kinds of these autoimmune lesions. So this uh, strongly suggested that indeed FOXP3 was required for the generation and function of these regulatory T cells. However, to make it a more you know to uh, they did this mixed what we call this uh, mixed bone marrow chimera. So basically. What you do is that you take uh, the bone marrow cells, which have the hematopoietic stem cells, which eventually makes the T cells. The wild type, uh, uh, wild type mice, as well as this fox pitchy null mice, and they make, made a 50-50 mixed bone marrow recipient mouse, which were previously, before that they were irradiated, to which will kill the uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And uh, on the other hand, they, these, these hematopoietic stem cells or the bone marrow cells from the, which are from these two donors, they uh, make up you know, the, the you know, stem cell compartments of these mice. And then they, you know, the stem cells, the, the precursors, they go to the thymus and the thymic development of T cells happen. And eventually what they found was that although the non-TREG, meaning that the CD4 positive CD25 negative compartment, uh, that was formed from the, you know, the, the stem cells, which are coming from either the wild type or the nulls, that, that was not affected. However, the TREG cells, the CD25 positive cells, that was only being made from the wild type bone marrow and not from the FOXP3 null bone marrow. And this, That indeed FOXP3 is one of, is the main factor which is required for the generation of these uh, CD5 T Rex cells. <clears throat> so now, can we have even even more direct proof that FOXP3 is indeed uh, expressed primarily in the CD4 positive, CD25 positive T cells? And for for that, they generated this uh, FOXP3 GFP reporter mouse, where the GFP uh, you know, the green fluorescent pro protein, it was engineered, genetically engineered on the uh, end terminus of the FOXP3 locus in these mice. And that only uh, primarily more than 95% of the CD25 positive T, T reg cells are actually green. And this was, again, so basically, uh, it, it, uh, first of all, it, it reinforced the fact, the uh, findings that FOXP3 is indeed required. Secondly, it also, uh, and it was kind of surprising, uh, it was really surprising to sh and it, because the finding was that FOXP3 Fox was the uh, only transcript, like, sorry, T Rex cells exclusively are the cells which were found to express FOXP3. And this was really surprising because till date, most of the lineage transcription factors for any other cell types, they also have been shown to be expressed in other cell, other kind of, uh, you know, cells, and they have functions other places also. But FOXP3 till date, it's primarily expressed, has been shown to be only expressed in T-Rex cells and is required for the generation and function. And this reporter mouse 
uh, in the future after after this sorry after this uh, experiment it has been used efficiently throughout the world in different labs uh, you know to isolate t rex cells live t rex cells and to do different kinds of experiments for to uh, identify their functionality for example if you can i if you can sort out this gfp positive cells from the mice and if you can put them in uh, neonates uh, when they are very early uh, in their uh, after they're born uh, when when they have not actually developed their disease this gfp and actually rescue these mice from developing this carfi phenotype and this experiment particularly uh, was uh, very definitive in proving the fact that foxp3 positive regulatory t cells are indeed required for the you know the functionality of these cells and uh, which is exemplified here uh, by uh, you know showing that uh, these are the ones which are required to suppress the autoimmune diseases that these mice have so taken together these experiments and uh, of course i'm not going to tell uh, many others which many people did all over these years uh, to establish foxp3 is the linear specificity factor for the t rex cells now the next question is are the t rex cells required uh, for our to, to guard our immune system Do or only during the time when the t when, when the immune system is developing or is it, it when we become adults is it still required at a later part of your life as well so that it is kind of a a, 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 a guiding factor uh, of your uh, immune system throughout your life so to understand that uh, again this experiment was done by the rudensky lab they generated this mouse which is called which is which is called the fox which is dtr mouse so this uh, in the, this gfp uh, diphtheria toxin receptor it was introduced in the 3 prime region the fox p3 gene and before that it has a internal ribosome entry site and what happens is that after this gene is encoded after this gene is uh, you know the mrna of this gene uh, is formed at that point there is translation happening which translates foxp3 and also uh, ribosome comes and sits here and translates this region which forms the gfp dtr which comes to the surface and the, the only the t rex cells because foxp3 is only expressed in t rex cells only the t rex cells decorated with this gfp dtr on the surface any other cells that is important to understand so now if you treat this mice so this and, and this is a this is a human uh, receptor actually so you are basically making a, a, a genetically engineered engineered mouse where this is expressed on the surface of the mouse t rex cells and now if you can treat uh, these mice with diphtheria toxin what happens is there is a, a receptor mediated endocytosis of the diphtheria toxin uh, in this in this and uh, block the uh, the so called uh, elongation factor 2 and in that way they can uh, stop uh, mrna in, in a protein translation and eventually kills the cell so if you treat this mice otherwise they are fine if you don't give diphtheria toxin these mice are fine and they can go you know, grow to their adulthood however at a adult time if you can treat this mice with diphtheria toxin it results uh, in the elimination of this of these cells and the question is what happens do they remain this i mean or do they actually develop disease and to make a long story short this is what happens that indeed this if you if you delete these uh, cells they actually turn like this carfi mouse or they they become the whole body autoimmune and they they die within about two weeks after the if you continue giving that diphtheria toxin so that means depletion of t rex cells from adult mice uh, you know basically uh, t rex cells are guardians of our immune system throughout our life lifespan 
And this uh, Fox P3 IDS DTR mouse, this is now widely used to dissect different roles uh, uh, of T-Rex cells in health and disease. And I'll give you one example of that text of uh, anti-tumor immunity. So as I was mentioning before, the T-Rex cells are required so basically, they they are you know utilized in the context of tumor uh, to suppress anti-tumor immunity, and they, they kind of uh, potentiate tumor growth. So uh, can so basically the question is if you can have a system where in a, in a tumor if you can eliminate these cells, does that actually uh, reduce tumor growth or not? Right. So it's it's kind of a proof of principle experiment that. Uh, can be done if you can eliminate these cells. So in that context, uh, this experiment was done by my previous colleague, uh, previous colleague Paula Boss, who is now in Virginia Commonwealth University. Polyuma yeah. middle T antigen. Uh, so basically, a cell line which overexpresses this, which is a oncogene. And if you and this oncogene drives breast cancer, and if you can, you know implant these uh, POIMT overexpressing cell lines into these mice, it, they develop uh, uh, breast cancer. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, eventually, so what happened was, uh, so the question is now, if you give them this tumor, either in wild type condition or in the diptyrotoxin receptor, DTR mice, and if you treat them, which eliminates uh, the T-Rex, what happens? Does that reduce the tumor burden or not? And that is what they found, is that in the control mice, they have uh, increased tumor volume over the time. However, if you can, uh, you know, if you eliminate cells, they, that uh, significantly and Here, this is the number of metastatic fossa in the lung. So, this is I will stress to the fact that this is a, a proof of principle. Let's say if you uh, so it shows indeed that T Rex cell elimination reduces tumor growth, but you cannot do this right in for in the context of human, uh, you cannot eliminate all the all the tumors, uh, sorry, all the T Rex cells in your body because maybe you will not have tumor growth, but you will have, you will die from autoimmune diseases. So a uh, 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 holy grail in TREG research now is to identify specific uh, components of regulatory T cells, which are, which they are utilizing in a, in a tumor specific manner, this uh, anti-tumor immunity. So if you can actually target those uh, issues or those mechanisms in T-Rex cells, then hopefully you can, you know, you, you don't affect the regulatory T cells in other parts of your body, which is required for the systemic function. On the other hand, you can specifically eliminate their function in the, and this is what you know, many labs, including so how, how are T-Rex cells generated and how are T-Rex, how do they function? So I will very briefly talk about this. So T-Rex cells, the pre precursor cells of the T-Rex are the so-called CD4 positive, single positive cells. And from where T-Rex precursor cells are generated and uh, through a complicated mechanism which, which requires uh, signaling uh, and cytokines, for example, IL-2 and IL-15, they uh, express FOXP3 and generate so, so the so-called thymically generated T-Rex cells or, or T T-Rex cells <clears throat> in the thymus. And interestingly, as I uh, remember, I mentioned in my first few slides that when there is, when the CD4 T cells, they can, when they encounter TCR, very strong TCR signaling by, by binding to TCR MHC, most of them actually uh, die. For example, so if they have low TCR signaling, and becomes conventional cells, but in case they have, let's say, higher, uh, you know, TCR signaling where they strongly bind peptide MHC in the thymus, in that case, the conventional T cells do not uh, form and most of them die. 
On the other hand, they are destined to become for pitchy positive T-rexes. And this is, uh, if you remember, I was mentioning this term called diversion. So basically the ones which are destined to you know, become self-destructive T-cells, they either they die or they're diverted to become regulatory T-cells which can actually control the self-destructive T-cells, okay? So basically when you have uh, strong, when, when these T-cells are destined to have very strong TCA signaling, they become regulatory T-cells in the thymus. And these are, as I mentioned, this is one, one kind of regulatory T-cells called thymically uh, generated tt cells. And there, are, there is broadly speaking another <clears throat> kind of regulatory T cells which are generated in the periphery. So, for example, this when they come out to the periphery, these are naive T cells. Uh, it can actually happen that in un, under certain conditions, and this primarily happens by this pleiotropic cytokine uh, TGF beta, and of course TCS signaling. Uh, these CD4 positive FOXP3 negative T cells with the naive non T rex cells, they and can become what we call peripherally induced T T rex cells, which are distinct from these thymically induced T T rex cells. Beta plays an important role uh, in this. And uh, so, this is broadly speaking the peripherally induced T rex cells. So, as you can imagine, these P-T-Rex cells, they are actually, uh, the, they are, uh, you know, specific sites in our, in our body where they actually are generated. And the main site where they are generated, as you can imagine, are the sites which has the highest threat uh, to be uh, outside and which are the barrier sites, right? So basically intestine, the gut associated lymphoid tissues, which are the sites of these immune cells and where you, know, you encounter foreign antigen the most, uh, food antigen, be it food antigen or common cell or you know, gut microbiota. These are the places where T-Rex cells are generated. And what happens, uh, briefly speaking, the gut microbiota or food, these antigens are taken up by the dendritic cells and they turn after this taken after this interaction happens. These regular these dendritic cells, uh, they can actually turn their phenotype to what we call regulatory dendritic cell phenotype, and by they can produce these so-called anti-inflammatory cytokines, for example, TGF beta or IL-10, and they influence the naive T cells, which at that time are FOXP3 negative, and they influence these naive T cells by mainly producing TGF beta to become peripherally induced T-Rex cells, which controls this inflammation. So uh, that, that was very briefly talking about how T-Rex cells are generated. Now I will again very briefly talk about how do they function? What are the different means of functioning of T-cells? And the main take home lesson here is that cells, the they function by not just one mechanism. They have various types of mechanisms by which they can function. And as you can imagine, there can be two ways by, by which uh, these T-Rex cells can function. The one, the first one I will discuss a little bit is this direct way of suppression by which these naive cells are, you know, uh, suppressed by these uh, regulatory T cells from becoming these affected T cells. This, so basically this phase, this proliferation of the naive T cells to the effector uh, phenotype is blocked by the T rex cells. And as I, as I mentioned, there are several, I will just talk about three of them, which are, uh, which can be very easily understood. So one of them is like, is, is this, which is called, <clears throat> uh, if you, if you uh, remember that the regulatory T cells, they have the C25, which is, uh, 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 which is the alpha subunit of IL-2 receptor. And you can imagine these T-Rex cells as a sponge, which takes up, which sponge, which basically, uh, you know, attracts all the IL-2 uh, as a sponge and takes it up. And in that way, it, uh, these, these effector T-cells are 
uh, you know, they cannot get access to this IL-2 in that way. And because IL-2 is required for their, you know, survival uh, and cause their death by apoptosis or other functions. So this is one mechanism by soaking up the effective T cell and eliminating via these so-called inhibitory cytokines. T-Rex cells can produce different kinds of inhibitory cytokines. For example, TGF beta, which I mentioned before, IL-10, IL-35, and they have anti-inflammatory effect on effective T cells and stops them from function. I'll not get into details, but this is uh, broadly speaking how it works. Third way is that they can actually produce uh, some cytokines, or uh, sorry, some uh, molecules, which can be detrimental uh, for the effective function or which can directly kill this uh, uh, effective T cells. And examples are granzymes, granzyme A and B, as well as perforins. So perforins are structural proteins, which these T -rex cells can uh, secrete and they can form kind of pores on this. Uh, then granzymes can get inside and induce apoptosis in this. That's, that is the third uh, function that I will. I will. Uh, so another way is by indirect suppression, by uh, somehow, uh, you know, coming in the way of this antigen presenting cell and an IFT cell interaction. Uh, and so, uh, and I will very briefly talk about a few of them. One of them is that T Rex cells can express this cell surface molecule CTLF4. I'm sure some of you, uh, you know, heard uh, Shilpok's talk uh, a couple of, you know, I think two, two terms before my talk uh, in the same platform. And CTLF4 is one of the protein which is a co inhibitory factor. So CTLF4 uh, is expressed uh, to a great extent on the surface of uh, uh, regulatory T cells, and they can bind to this, what are called uh, these CD80 and 86, which are required for activation of, of T cells. And by binding them, it inhibits DC function and also comes on the way of T cell activation. So that is one way by which it, it suppresses T, uh, T cell uh, activation. Second one is through this uh, protein called LAG3, which is, a, which is a, a homolog for the CD4 molecule. And it can interact with the MHC class two on the dendritic cells and uh, presses or, or, or inactivates their maturation. In that way, disease cannot mature and T, -rex and T cells cannot, you know, the, the antigen presentation is blocked in that way. Uh, and the last one I will talk about this uh, is that the disease can actually condition dendritic cells to produce this indolamin 2 3 dioxygenase, which is, uh, which is secreted by the dendritic cells. And, and this, this enzyme catabolic products. And these catabolic products, uh, they have receptors on the, uh, on the inhibitory receptor that inhibits. Uh, effector T cell function. And also by breaking down tryptophan, it, uh, so it reduces the tryptophan pool from uh, which is required for the effector T cell functions. Okay. So these three are again, very generally speaking, some, some examples of how it can indirectly work. Well, now in the fourth part, I will actually talk about, as I mentioned, my, uh, some research from our laboratory, uh, where we, wanted to explore uh, the, some therapeutic aspects of how T-Rex cells can be utilized for our betterment. And as I mentioned, uh, there are two, two pronged eff, uh, effect of T-Rex cells function, uh, and which is relevance to, of relevance to inflammation and cancer. If you can, block, if you can enhance uh, somehow the induction or stability or function of regulatory T cells that will be useful, uh, that can be mediators of anti-inflammation and that can be useful in the context of autoimmune diseases. On the other hand, if you can block uh, the T-Rex cells as targets in the context of cancer, 
that by compromising induction stability or function, that will be beneficial. Hopefully that will be beneficial. And I'll be talking about this part where we have tried to utilize some kind of, uh, I'll talk about that in, in, in a few seconds, uh, a way, a means to induce regulatory T cells and that that will be beneficial in the context of implement. And I'll, before that, I'll just mention that as many of you know, that gut microbiota and the immune system has very important relationship. And uh, there are various species of gut microbiota, uh, mainly commensal microbiota, um, which can influence our in immune system. And it is required for the he healthy development of, of our immune system and uh, various physiological functions. And this interaction between the immune system and the uh, gut microbiota is explored uh, all over, you know, immune research, uh, you know, for the betterment of humanity. And can sound actually ridiculous, but uh, various kinds of things are being tried. For example, people are trying to use fecal microbiota transplant where, uh, you know, the you know, human teeth are, are dried up and processed in, in very, you know, complicated process. And they are making, uh, you know, their package so that this microbiota uh, can be utilized as supplements for, you know, in various as, you know, probiotics or, you know, for therapeutic content. So, so this, this study was initiated by Chang'an Li, who is uh, my long-term collaborator. So Chang'an was a student in Shinyok's lab and I, in this study, acted as a co-mentor. And what he is that, so we know that microbiota, bacteria, which is, you know, commensal microbiota, Been actually utilized, uh, you know, to ask these kind of questions for many many years now. So whether bacteria is important, whether it can influence our, our immune system, you know, in a positive way as a probiotic, and if it, it can use. That not only bacteria in our in our intestine, we also have yeast species. Microbiota, uh, these yeast species. Whether we can identify specific yeast species in our, in our, our I mean, by you know, we did all these experiments in mice, which can be actually beneficial in terms of immune regulation, and which can is if we can identify some species or some components of that can induce regulatory T cells and whether that can be beneficial in the context of influence. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, uh, Dipayanda, but your yeah, voice yeah. is your voice is uh, breaking. I mean, in between you cannot hear. So I mean, how about now? Now, now it's fine. I think. Yeah. Sorry, okay, sorry so, for the interruption. Okay. Oh so, yeah, please let me know, huh? Because sometimes we are facing this problem. Is it okay now? Yeah, it is fine. Okay, okay. So uh, about one or two percent of our microbial biomass is uh, so, uh, this uh, biota. <clears throat> and uh, there are different cell surface polysaccharides components of this yeast that can that we know are recognized by uh, the different kinds of immune cell uh, antigen presenting cells, for example, dendritic cells and uh, macrophages. And uh, if you, uh, you know, recapitulate, you know, our uh, immunology textbook a little bit. So these components are what we call uh, uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns or PEMPs. And these components are called uh, uh, is uh, receptors, PRRs, or, or uh, pathogen recognition. 
these are uh, recognition receptors. So for example, these TLRs, dectins, and many others, these are the, uh, are the receptors on the cell surface of this antigen presenting cells. Atrogen recognition receptors. Uh, and really drive immune responses. Uh, and primarily for yeast, it was known that it can drive pro-inflammatory uh, uh, responses. Uh, um, uh, before going ahead, I will just take a little bit time to talk a little bit about these building blocks of yeast cell surface polysaccharides. They're all uh, basically formed of different uh, polysaccharides which are formed by these building blocks of uh, primarily glucose molecules. So there are these alpha D glucose, and then there are epimers of glucose, which is galactose, which is C4 epimer of glucose, and C2 epimer of glucose, which is mannose. And they can form they can form different linkages between these uh, hydroxyl groups, and these are called, for example, this is one three linkage, this is one six linkage, and they can there can be different kinds of permutations and combinations of these kind, all these different moieties, and there can be side chains. So this is overall a brief overview of how these polysaccharides are made. And this mannan here, this is formed of polymers of mannose, galactose, and glucose. Beta-glucan, primarily in yeast, we know that these are composed of beta-1,3-glucan, uh, and uh, where the glucose molecules are, are joined by the glycosidic linkages, 1,3 linkages. And there, there is this chitin, which is uh, polymers of N-acetyl-glucosamine. So Changon started off this project by utilizing the so-called uh, uh, component of yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is called zymosan. So basically, these are host yeast cells, and where the I mean uh, these are gen these are uh, manufactured in a way by which you know the the cytoplasm and the nucleus nucleus is eliminated, and these are like a, a blob of of these. Uh, yeast cells, which are which have intact cell wall, and they have all these chitin, uh, glucan, and uh, other components. So the the polysaccharide components is present there. <clears throat> so uh, initially, he started doing these experiments to ask by utilizing zymosan whether it has some kind of a, a you know it can skew the uh, CD4 T cells to a specific uh, phenotype. So now naive T cells, they were incubated with dendritic cells in the presence of zymosan or uh, without it uh, as a control. And then they were driven to either Th1, Th17 or Treg. Now Th1 and Th17, of course, I have not mentioned before. I'm sure many of you are aware of, aware of this. These are mainly pro-inflammatory, they produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. And uh, so the question is, uh, and prim primarily Th1, they make uh, interferon gamma. The question is, if you, uh, if you, Zymosan in this kind of assay, what happens? Do, do they, you know, uh, can, they promote Fox P3 expression or interferon gamma expression or IL-17, which is a, which is produced on Th7. And what he found was that it actually promotes a little bit of interferon gamma production, okay? And nothing happens with regard to T-Rex or IL-17. So it induces a little bit, meaning only, let's say, from 43% to 55% of induction of interferon. And it was not surprising because it was known that beta-glucan component of the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is 1,3 <coughs> beta-glucan, it has pro-inflammatory activity. So next he asked, how much of this pro-inflammatory activity is, is indeed beta-1,3 glucan? Can you actually eliminate beta-1,3 glucan from this uh, yeast, uh, from the yeast cell wall? And uh, does that have any effect? And does that cause any, any changes in this acid? So what he did was he utilized this beta-1,3 glucanase, which is an enzyme which can you know, break down these bond, this bonds and which uh, eliminates beta-1,3 uh, glucan moiety and the magic. So if you do that, it first of all 
the, the, the pro-inflammatory response by induction of interferon gamma, that was gone. It went to the baseline. On the other hand, he saw a dose-dependent increase of FOXP3 expression or Treg induction. Uh, so, suggested that each cell surface, uh, it's basically uh, the cell surface of the, you know, the polysaccharides are probably composed of not only beta-1,3 glucan, it also has something which is hidden under the abundance of this beta-1,3 glucan and uh, which is unmasked by eliminating beta, uh, this by this enzyme. And when it is unmasked, that has anti-inflammatory properties and that uh, can induce uh, T-Rex cells. And so this led to the, uh, you know, to the uh, or such uh, chemicals, such uh, anti-inflammatory components. And to make a long story short, and this was done by uh, uh, Cristina Di Castro's lab and, uh, and Antonio Molinaro, who are in University of Napoli and our long-term collaborator. And by various uh, NMR studies and linkage studies, uh, we used to purify the components and we used to send it to them and they did all these studies and they eventually found that there are two components of the East cell wall. One is mannan component and one is glucan component. And this mannan component is, you know, I will not get into detail. They have this alpha one, two linkages with the side chains and the glucan component has this beta one, six linkages, beta one, three side chain, and which is the minor part of this, of this uh, thing. And this whole moiety, we named it as uh, mannan beta one, six glucan containing polysaccharides or MGCP. And I will, this is what I will mention for the rest of the talk. And eventually it was found that this minor component, 15%, which is present only 15%, uh, that is the, uh, the main component, main uh, which is required for the IT regeneration or peripheral induced regeneration and the repression of TH1 response. And then uh, we did a, a lot of experiments utilizing this NGCP and we found, and uh, of course I will not get into detail because you know, that will require a lot of explanations of these studies. But basically, if you treat the mice with MGCP and if you, you know, in the and let them become IT rex cells inside in vivo the mice, that indeed induce, uh, MGCP induces uh, peripheral induced T-rex cells more than the more. On the other hand, they can reduce uh, H1 cells or interferon gamma production. So indeed, uh, MDCP can induce cells in, uh, in vivo. Uh, we utilize two different models of experimental uh, models of autoimmune diseases or inflammatory diseases. One of them is the cell, tra cell transfer uh, colitis model. So mice, uh, these are rag knockout mice, which are immunocompromised mice and which do not have their own T cells or B cells. And we transfer this CB naive T cells. So CB is a, so these, these T cells are T cell transgenic for the flagellin protein, which is this, you know, uh, microbiota, intestinal microbiota, uh, the, the input for the, for the functional protein flagellin. And these T cells can recognize this flagellin. And when you, if you transfer only these T cells inside the mice, that eventually you know, gets activated in the intestine and cause harm to the intestine, intestinal barrier sites. And epithelial. eventually that translates to this uh, uh, very strong colitis in these mice. But if you, uh, you know, treat this uh, in rescues these mice from colitis, and this is the readout is this uh, you know body weight loss, uh, and so this is only the mock, and this is NGCP, and this was correlated with increase in uh, Fox cells and reduction in interferon gamma. 
So this is one uh, model we utilize. And the second model we, we utilize with, so uh, it is called the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis or EAE model. This is a, a model for multiple sclerosis where, you know, the, uh, you know, the myelin sheet of, you know, of the nervous system is attacked by the immune system. And we know that regulatory T cells have very important role in, you know, um, saving uh, us from this uh, autoimmune disease of EAE and from the... And in this context also, if you treat them with MDCP, that to our surprise completely eliminates the clinical score or the disease score of this, uh, of this uh, which was, you know, in this mock you can see. This correlated with reduction in, uh, you know, the detrimental inflammatory uh, cell types, which in this case are the IL-17 positive and interferon gamma positive cells. And it also increased the T-Rex cells, which are not showing here. In both, this con both these contexts of colitis and EAE, uh, MGCP seem to have a positive effect. So now what are the mechanisms? So first, how, how, do, how do MGCP work? So first, we, we ask this simple question that if you, in, if you treat the mice with MGCP, microbiota, uh, you know, components or, or the, you know, the, uh, the balance of the microbiota towards the more favorable one, which can be required for the, which can be, you know, causing the, this uh, inflammatory effect. So this, this uh, was done for this, we did 16 as sequencing. <clears throat> the gut microbiota of the mock or NGCP treated mice. This was uh, the analysis part. We collaborated with Sundeep and Obishek Lahiri uh, in AIS as well as, uh, and at that time, I think he was in uh, PSIR. Uh, I, we found the take-home lesson was it was not affected. Gut microbiota remained unaffected by NGCP treatment. Can we ask, does microbiota work directly on T-Rex cells or is it a DC dependent process? So does it work through dendritic cells and that affects uh, the generation of T-Rex cells? And indeed we find that by both uh, in vivo and in vitro experiments, we found that indeed NGCP works in a DC dependent manner. Here, this, uh, this, you know, D manos we used to utilize, uh, utilize this a, a, it as a, as a, as a positive control in this case. And however, the MGCP, it only. And uh, to identify what, what changes does uh, MGCP cells uh, upon its treatment, we did RNA-seq analysis after treating them at different time points. And uh, to make a long story short, we stumbled upon this factor, this protein or, or this gene, which was highly expressed upon uh, um, uh, uh, an important enzyme in this uh, uh, generation of the prostaglandin pathway. So it, it is, a, you know, one of the enzymes that, uh, you know, is required for prostaglandin production from arachidonic acid. <clears throat> and it has, and this prostaglandin has, it's, it's a, it's a uh, important uh, hormone, which has pleiotropic effect uh, at various, in various contexts of the immune system. And to us, uh, it is important to understand that in the context of tumor, it was found that uh, specifically prostaglandin E2 has a positive role on T-Rex development or generation in the context of tumor. So prostaglandin E2 enhances T-Rex cells in the tumor. So because uh, in, in this context, it was upregulated in, in dendritic cells, we asked whether COX-2 is an important factor which is required for the generation of T-Rex cells by MGCP. And first we 
you know, confirm that indeed, but this is by real time PCR that prostaglandin, sorry, COX2 is upregulated in dendritic cells. And if you block uh, it by this uh, cholecoxib, this is uh, inhibitor prostaglandin that reduces I2 differentiation. And on the other hand, it, uh, you know, restores interferon gamma expression uh, in this context. So indeed, COX2 is an important factor which is required uh, by the, in, in this process by MDCP. So how is MDCP recognized? What are the components of the cell surface of the dendritic cell that recognizes MDCP? And as I mentioned, these are all the pattern uh, recognition receptors. Now I remember this. So uh, there are several of these and, and, and in the context of different of these uh, PAMPs, they can bind to different kinds of PAMPs and can uh, trigger different kinds of immune responses. And we utilize several different mice that were available in our facility, knockout mice, and to ask, uh, basically to ask which one of them remains unaffected to the MGCP mediated in, in, in the And to make a long story short, we found that this molecule, dectin-1, which is a receptor which is known to you know, you know, recognize polysaccharides on yeast, that is the one which, which is required for, for this recognition and which is required for induction of it cells. In here, this molecule CSGG, I will not get into detail, it was used as a control. And in a different context, but in a different uh, you know, study that we did, it was, it was shown to be expressed by uh, a specific bacteria and also induces T-Rex cells and that works through uh, TLR2 and we utilized it here as a control. So now, uh, again, in our, uh, if you utilize this dectin-1 knockout mice, and if you utilize, if you you know do a in vitro itrex generation, uh, whereas uh, wild type mice can they can generate itrex here in dectin one knockout recipient mice, uh, they don't this beneficial effect of MGCP is gone. And also, if you utilize this dectin one knockout mice, they now are susceptible to EA. So this is the dectin one wild type and. Uh, this one is the knockout, which where the MG, where MDCP treated beneficial effect is gone. So indeed, it is working today. So, as I, if you remember, uh, MDCP has two pronged effect, right? One is that it can induce IT cells or PT cells. On the other hand, it can also also mediated by dectin-1. And kind of surprisingly, we found that it was not. So in a dectin-1 knockout mice, still you can get this down regulation. Uh, in, on the other hand, we found that TLR2 is, so TR, in TLR2 knockout mice, we don't see that response. And however, both uh, dectin-1 knockout and TLR2 knockout, they are incapable of upregulating this uh, MGCP expression. So in a way, so this is my final slide, and uh, this is the mechanism, the mechanism slide which I'm going to, you know, uh, show is that it seems that uh, this MGCP, which is encoded by the yeast cell, they can work in two ways. One is through dectin-1, which is required through COX-2, or to induce ITREX cells, suppressing TH1. And on the other hand, the TLR2 mechanism, uh, also in a COX2, COX2 mediated mechanism, it suppresses TH1 response. So in both ways, it suppresses uh, in inflammatory, pro-inflammatory responses, which is required for the function, uh, for the, you know, suppressing these uh, inflammatory diseases. So that was all I had to talk about, and I will thank all my previous students and uh, uh, collaborators, including Obishek and Shondip.
thank you so much uh, dipanda for <coughs> such an illuminating talk on the role of fox p3 based t rex cell biology and uh, mostly in controlling the immune tolerance and also the another very important thing people are talking about the microbiota but uh, the importance of gut microbiota actually in immunity and inflammatory diseases i mean that's another way i mean gut microbiota is another very important thing and your work is uh, basically showing that thing so um, uh, i'm requesting all the participants uh, i mean to please i mean stop sharing no or what yeah you can you can stop share so uh, please questions i mean you can ask or you can also write it down in the chat box so yeah i already got one <coughs> question so the first one is uh, is there any site or organ specificity for t rex cells so initially when t rex were, were identified they were identified in the you know lymphatic system right so Uh, lymph nodes and spleen but eventually now over the last several years almost like a decade now we know that in any tissue under the earth you can you look into t rex cells are, are present and they're functionally present for example skin uh, lung heart brain everywhere they're present so i would say that there is no specific site maybe there there are specific uh micro environments where they are present niches and we are not we don't know much about that okay so before i take another question from the student i mean i have a, just one naive question i mean as you say i mean this uh, t rex cell is uh, uh, both type of suppressive and activative role in uh, autoimmunity versus uh, cancer so what is the status i mean if uh, in case of uh, autoimmune diseases uh, some individual or some mice if uh, uh, he or she or it has some autoimmune diseases so uh, what will be the fate of uh, any cancer there if any instance of cancer so uh, i mean this is a very uh, naive question actually so i mean the negative correlation between autoimmune exactly, i mean exactly uh, people who are prone to autoimmune diseases versus cancer i think there there is and uh, although it's complicated because inflammation has been known to be a important factor chronic inflammation uh, can lead to cancer so yeah i mean i there is no direct uh, no one word answer to that it, it has to be you know discuss in detail okay But so so one uh, question from the student is how were t rex cells activated so the activation process is the same meaning they also have t cell receptors and the t cell receptors can recognize uh, specific uh, mhc peptides on dendritic um, cells or other antigen presenting cells Signal one and signal two for normal T cell activation. One is the TCR, one is the CD28, and uh, so it's it's the process is the same by which they are activated. Yeah. So uh, and another question is: uh, Do T rex cells promote uh, inflammation? Promote inflammation. This yeah. is an interesting question. So. by definition uh, because they are anti inflammatory and they suppress inflammatory diseases and inflammatory cell types they do not however uh, in the context of various you know diseases for example multiple sclerosis diabetes etc it has been known it has been shown that t rex cells can actually lose fox p3 if they lose fox p3 then these t rex cells are now called ex fox p3 t rex cells and at this time they can start producing cytokines which are pro inflammatory cytokines and in that context they can become even they can have even detriment more detrimental if effects than other t cells so they are good in a way but if they turn bad they are really bad so they are they in however in that context they are not t rex cells anymore right so they are ex t rex cells at that point so your answer of your question is yes and no because 
you know, they can, but at that point, they have actually lost FOX P3 in the context of inflammation. And they are now can produce, you know, more cytokines and be detrimental. And uh, another question is, uh, are uh, T-Rex cells uh, polyclonal? Yes, so T-Rex cells, uh, because they are generated in thymus primarily, and also in the outside. So the, 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 you know, the precursor cells have different kinds of T cell receptors. So because T rex cells are being generated from the precursors, they have, they have different kinds of T cell receptors on the surface. So they are polyclonal, yes. Okay. So there is another question from Iftikar. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I have learned so many new things. Sir, uh, would you please tell me uh, how the P T rex cells are formed? Okay, so this is again. So uh, let's say there is there is a T cell, a naive T cell, which is not T rex cell at that point. Let's say it's it's in the uh, in your intestine, right? In the specific sites of your intestine, which are called lamina propria, and let's say it recognizes some specific antigen. Uh, uh, dendritic cells which has taken up a particular uh, foreign let's say food particle or foreign microbiota and that has presented this antigen and eventually which has uh, receptors which is designed to which which is you know which can recognize that peptide mhc and this dendritic cell, when it is presenting, let's say in that in that microenvironment, there is TGF beta. So while presenting, this TGF beta can work on the TGF beta. And while this T-Rex, this naive T beta signaling happening and down so we, of that. Sorry to five, Sorry to yeah. interrupt you, Dipanda, but uh, I mean your voice actually uh, was uh, breaking now, now, down. Now? Yeah, now now we can hear. Okay, you. so okay, so uh, I don't know how much you heard. So uh, let's say there is this dendritic cell presenting this yes, antigen. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, and and then it is also there is high amount of TGF beta in that microenvironment, and the, the TGF beta is uh, simultaneously the signaling from TGF beta is happening. There are these signal transduction caskets happening. There are SMAD proteins, which are downstream, which are transcription factors. And they entered the nucleus of these T cells. And there are sites on the Fox Pitchy locus where the SMAD can bind, uh, which are the enhancer sites of, of, of uh, Fox Pitchy. And this a combinatorial effect of the T cell receptor signaling and SMAD signaling, as well as IL-2 signaling, that drives the uh, activation of Fox P3 locus and, and that drives Fox P3 expression, which eventually you know turns these cells, these naive T cells or non T rex cells into T rex cells. So that is you know as brief as you can imagine an explanation. Okay, thank you. And there is another question uh, from Papun that uh, what is the role of uh, inflammation in human malignant progression? Topic, right? So, so during the malignant, various kinds of components, and throughout your lifetime, if you have chronic inflammation, that uh, you know plays a role in, in genesis. So, on the other hand, there are various aspects which actually can you know suppress tumor uh, growth. So there are different kinds of uh, black and it's it's not black and white. There are different issues that has to be dealt with, and it's it's not a one, you know, one-liner question or answer. And even of course not clear to me, and of course uh, probably to many researchers. So a long ongoing research is going on on this on the various aspects of inflammation on uh, malignancy. Okay, so uh, Iftikar is thanking you for uh, this uh, PT-Rexel related questions. 
and there is another question i think it's uh, fox b3 whether it is a nuclear protein or yes, not yes it's a transcription factor transcription so factor so it's well, and you ask what is the main reason i don't understand what does it yeah mean? that i also don't understand what is the main reason i don't know it should be there so uh, if you have any questions you can always write to me i will be very happy to answer yeah that's a great opportunity to all the students and the phd scholars you can directly contact uh, dr dipan rudra for your any queries so uh, so uh, with uh, so yeah another question from bidhi said i wanted to ask if the t rex cells always use a dominant mechanism to suppress i would say that it is the actually the so remember i said it, there is one component uh, you know which is called central tolerance another component which is called peripheral tolerance which happens outside and mainly it is that is done by t rex cells another way of you know defining the peripheral tolerance we use the term dominant tolerance so i would say yes you can say that t rex cells are dominant cell types which are required to actively suppress uh and then the inflammatory responses so i cannot see more questions so thank you uh, all the participants and uh, dr dipan rudra on behalf of uh, our institute and uh, our center for uh, uh, presenting uh, this nice illuminating talk and uh, thank you so much and uh, have a great day thank you thank you so much bye bye so we are ending here the session thank you all participants